I think a lot of black people uh, can relate to the idea of not feeling black enough. I feel like I've always kind of struggled with the idea of identity growing up and just trying to figure out to where I fit in as a black person. And although I seem very like passionate and proud and racial justice warrior now, um, this is honestly very new to me to kind of embrace all of my identity. Um, and being okay with feeling like I don't really fit into the constructs of blackness. A lot of weird people who think that there's only one way to be black. White audiences didn't quite understand me, but black audiences especially didn't understand me. I'm a big nerd who likes sci-fi and video games. Little did I know that finding enjoyment in these things made me not black enough. And I feel like it is a lot of people in my race that are perpetuating that idea. It makes me feel really, really rejected. White people already do this. They already discriminate against us. They already push their stereotypes onto us. So why are we doing it to each other? Black people, but more specifically, American black people, hold a very specific status in the world. Because American black people, I mean, you just look at how much they've done to influence modern day pop culture. This general swag that they've brought to everything. People just want to participate in whatever black people are talking about or are doing or are pioneering. You know, I'm cool, plus I'm black, which is cool, so I win twice. Essentially, we're at the very heart and soul of pop culture, even if we're not always giving credit for it. And oftentimes, being black is synonymous with being cool. But this internalized standard of what's expected from the black community can also unintentionally leave many feeling othered or not black enough if they don't feel that they fit into the mold and live up to the standard of being hip and cool by the means of our culture. So today I'm going to explore what it means to be a blurred, a black nerd or at the very least, deconstruct what it means to navigate the world as a black person possessing stereotypically nerdy or quirky traits. According to Wikipedia, a nerd is a person seen as overly intellectual, obsessive, introverted, or lacking social skills. Such a person may spend a lot of time on unpopular, little known, or non-mainstream activities such as science fiction or fantasy. So a bit of etymology for how this term came to be. Nerd was typically used as a synonym for drip or square in 1951 Detroit, which essentially referred to someone who was very conventional, traditional, and out of touch with mainstream trends. Some oral traditions may have suggested that nerd is a derivative of drunk spelled backwards, which, you know, obviously refers to someone who studies rather than parties, maybe not so obvious. But that is a speculation that I found in my research. A little fun fact, the first time we saw the word nerd documented is in Dr. Seuss's 1950 book, If I Ran the Zoo. This is one of his uh, books that got pulled for, you know, racist imagery. Um, but the word nerd was used here to describe an odd looking fictional creature, but this wasn't a usage like that we associate now with our understanding of nerds. The term nerd became popular with the rise of the technology industry, but also with the media. In the 1970s sitcom Happy Days, this term was used oftentimes as an insult. And in typical nerd fashion, the wrong move. What am I gonna do with your funds early, huh? I will say there are common synonyms to nerd that are often just used interchangeably with it. Things like geek, dork, dweeb. But each of these terms do have unique meanings and are slightly different. They're used in different contexts, but what they do have in common is the fact that it's used to describe people who are typically very socially awkward, have weird, non-social, or peculiar interests, and are just overall othered socially. But for the sake of this video, I'm gonna be focusing on the nerd term specifically. The idea of what nerdiness is has definitely become a lot more elusive over time. What makes somebody a nerd today is a lot less concrete than it was like several decades ago. We have this person in my comments who says, I think that in the past, nerds were seen as people with certain interests, things like comics, anime, and games. As these have become more loved by more people and become more mainstream, I began to wonder, does this mean the world has become more nerdy? So because of this reason, I decided to break down nerd characteristics into two categories. Number one is the nerd caricature. This is the over-exaggerated, stereotypical definition of a nerd. These are typically the depictions we see in movies and in TV shows and just in the media in general. And then list number two is going to be taking feedback 
feedback from self-identified nerds and sort of accumulating the similar characteristics they share today. But starting off with the nerd caricature. In the media, nerds are typically shown as being very techy or like computer whizzes. This is mainly due because the term nerd uh, gained popularity when tech, the technology industry was first sort of introduced and was not as commonplace as it is today. It was seen as more elite and only for like really smart people, AKA nerds. Nerd characters are typically shown as loving school or really enjoying learning. And I want to get back to school. I simply crave academic nourishment. And these characters are typically very enthusiastic about science, math, engineering, or computer science. Nerd characters are typically enthusiastic and very intellectual about other peculiar topics, such as like sci-fi, comics, anime, manga, Dungeons and Dragons. So therefore, these people might enjoy live action role play, cosplay, or attend nerdy conventions such as Comic-Con. Nerd characters are typically shown as loners, being a bit socially awkward, not really getting social cues. They certainly don't have a lot of friends, not like a girlfriend or boyfriend by any means. And nerd characters are typically shown as being naive and usually get taken advantage of by the protagonist or the more popular character. Nerd characters are shown as being unattractive, wearing very high-waisted pants, thick glasses. They usually dress extremely formally with like, you know, suspenders, maybe a bow tie. And typically nerd characters are shown to have braces. Where this is something I never really got because like, I don't know how braces got associated with nerds because braces just means I'ma have straight teeth and you won't. But that's just me though. <laughs> and probably the overarching characteristics of nerd caricatures is that nerdiness is seen as an inherent character flaw. And nerds are typically shown that they need to be cool or fixed by cool people to be able to be accepted, to have friends, and to just overall enjoy life. And clumsiness is only part of the problem. You're also annoying and socially inept, Steve. It would be nice if you tried to change. Steve? No, 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 no. <laughs> there is no Steve here. I'm Stefan, sweet thing. So in essence, there is a strong correlation between being smart and being a nerd and an even stronger inverse correlation between being a nerd and being popular. So what is a nerd today? As I said earlier, this term has become a lot more elusive as more nerdy things have become mainstream. As we can see from this commenter, Jasmine, she says that I've never considered myself to be a nerd. I do, however, enjoy coding, reading, video games, and other nerdy activities. I was also a biomedical science major. I think I'm cool AF. Period. <laughs> so yes, this is an example of people who possess nerdy qualities, but don't necessarily associate with that nerd terminology. So I went to my comments, I asked you guys if you consider yourself a nerd, and if so, what factors make you identify as such? I've accumulated all of like the similar factors that y'all self-identified nerds had, and I came up with this list. So according to my comments, self-identified nerds are typically kind of socially awkward or maybe kind of shy or introverted. Self-identified nerds express their interests in more alternative genres of media or entertainment that are typically perceived to have very niche communities. So things like anime, manga, indie music, comics, things like that. Self-identified nerds in my comments also mentioned that they are interested in sci-fi or fantasy, things like Star Trek, Star Wars, in the MCU, for example. Nerds today may cosplay or intend like the nerdy conventions I mentioned before, such as Comic-Con or PAX, E3, those types of conventions. People who consider themselves nerds in my comments also said that they were pretty book smart or they were good in school or enjoyed learning. And there was a common thread of people saying that they enjoy subjects such as STEM, history, and literature. But more than anything, the overarching theme that I found is that nerds have a plethora of knowledge and a lot of enthusiasm about any one particular topic. Somebody in my comments says that for me, being a nerd is not defined by what you love, but by how you love. Nerds are people who really dive into the things they love. They want to know all the ins and outs, the lore, the everything. Another commenter, Briar X Rose, says that being a history nerd, a tech nerd, or a math slash science nerd is different from being a movie nerd, a gaming nerd, an anime nerd, and so on. And then finally, another commenter says that 
I often dig deeper into stuff than what is seen as normal. I love books and gaming, and I also consider myself a makeup nerd. So you can see here that nerds today are typically just anyone who has a lot of interest in any particular topic, no matter what it is. In fact, many self-identified nerds see this term as a sense of pride. We have this commenter who says, I'm one of those people who grew up in a time where being a nerd was a bad thing. Now that I'm an adult who can really set my own rules and more importantly buy my own stuff, I embrace the term and heavily identify with it. So not only have a lot of traditionally nerdy things become mainstream, like take gaming or like anime, for example, but activities and interests that would make you an outcast like years ago now have online communities. And some media depictions now even show their nerdy characters doing more normal people things or like what's stereotypically popular kid activities. Things like having a girlfriend or a boyfriend who's not solely there to take advantage of them or dressing nice or normally I should say. <laughs> so the small box of a nerd's word several years ago now have, you know, expanded, but some nerds still disassociate themselves with this term. We have Star Mayor in my comments who says, I always grew up with the exposure to the negative connotation of the geek slash nerd. So by nature, I struggle to identify that way. I will not outright dispute it when someone calls me one, but I will always be adverse to that phrase. And then we have another commenter who says, as a black woman, I've never really identified as a nerd, even though I've got a lot of nerdy interests like anime, manga, gaming, comics, and reading lots of books. I guess I never identified with the word because it's mainly white men who are portrayed. And this leads me to the next topic I wanna to explore, which is where possessing nerdy qualities or traits collides with being black. So what does it mean to be black? Well, that answer will vary from person to person because there is no one single black experience. But I think a good place to start understanding this identity collision is by taking a look at black culture. This portion of the video specifically is going to hone in on black American culture, but just given the fact that we all originate from the same motherland, I'm sure that you can find a lot of similarities across the greater African diaspora. But with that being said, it's important to recognize blackness as not just a race, but as a culture in a community. Yes, there is that sort of universal experience we can all relate to just due to the ongoing effects of racism and colonialism in countries across the globe. But throughout slavery, the civil war and reconstruction in America, black Americans created their own culture to reinstill that pride and sense of belonging and community that was prohibited for us to experience express via the transatlantic slave trade. One of the biggest things I feel happened in America, you know, because of the slave trade is it wasn't just people that were stolen from Africa. It wasn't just lives that were stolen from Africa. The more I read about it, the more I understand that fundamentally they stole one of the most valuable things you can steal from a person. And that is the knowledge of your culture, mm. the knowledge of who you are a part of just because you are. One thing I've always admired about black Americans, and this is something that I feel has traversed the globe, is black Americans created a culture unto themselves, right. which is beautiful, you know, hip hop and, and, and style of language and, 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 and dressing and everything. And, and that became a culture. So black American culture was born out of our resilience, our resistance, and our innovation. However, it's important to note that as her so eloquently put it in YouTube Originals Black Renaissance documentary, black culture is more than the Americas, the Caribbean, and Europe, and it doesn't begin where freedom ends. Black culture begins where life does, in Africa. And so this video cannot encompass everything that is a part of black culture. But the things I'm gonna be sharing in this section are just based off of my own personal experiences and my own personal interactions with black people. Common cultural threads I've noticed just from following a variety of different black people and black thought leaders and black creators and also from the black media I consumed. So I tried to do my best to encapsulate a lot of contributions that black Americans have made specifically and a lot of 
things that black Americans have popularized and a lot of things that are common in black households and black families. So using all of these sources, perspectives, and voices, I came up with this list. But before we get into all that black culture entails, let's first start off by defining culture. So culture is an umbrella term which encompasses the social behavior and norms found in human societies. I went ahead and accumulated a bullet point list of all of the different elements that make up culture based off all the different definitions I read. And so here is the list that I came up with. So culture is the generational passing of habits, custom, values, language, and knowledge. It's your traditions and sort of way of doing things. Culture is the arts of a particular group or society, their literature, entertainment, music, fashion, and beauty standards. Culture consists of the laws, politics, individual pursuits, and community goals of a particular community. And finally, culture encompasses the achievements of a particular society. So culture is cultivated, culture is nourished, and most importantly, culture is generational. I will say though, because black Americans have had a unique experience due to the transatlantic slave trade, you know, we were not slaves, but we were enslaved. A lot of black American culture, what is considered that today, has a lot of roots to just Southern culture where a lot of the enslaved were held. And a lot of what has been passed down generationally is due to how our ancestors and how our families have had to deal with racism and oppression. Because we are still not very far far removed from civil rights and all of these other things. Like the oppression is still happening. And even in the 60s where we consider the civil rights era really still was not that long ago. There are a lot of things that oftentimes get associated with black culture, but aren't inherently so. So keep that in mind as I discuss the generational passing of knowledge and values and beliefs in this next section. So for starters, I think a lot of black Americans have adopted a sort of stricter parenting style, at least like, you know, it's, and it's definitely changing now, but at least like my parents' generation and like older, <laughs> I think a lot of black Americans can relate to specific sayings or attitudes that our parents or grandparents pass down to us. Like you wanna go to McDonald's, you got McDonald's money. <laughs> a lot of black kids know what it's like to get whooped, not just spanked, but whooped. <laughs> when you live under my house, you abide by my rules. I'm the parent, you the child. What happens in the house stays in the house. And like I said earlier, a lot of that has to do with like the need more so for black parents to prepare their child for the real world and what their grandparents and what their parents taught them. For a long time, our people's mentality has been more to survive. And so this mentality has passed down a lot of really good things. But then um, on the flip side, there has also been a lot of not so good things are not so positive things that have come as a result, which again, a lot of that is changing in this generation and the next kids that are coming up. But there is a lot of things that black Americans have inherited. I think something that has also been passed down to a lot of black American kids is the emphasis on education. For a majority of the time of this country, we were not given uh, the same educational opportunities or not afforded that. And so a lot of black families really prioritize how important it was to be educated, to learn how to read and to continue school. You'll notice that in a lot of black uh, families, being college educated is something that is prioritized. But uh, education, unfortunately, is still more of a privilege than a right. And so because of that, a lot of times street smarts or being street savvy is what was valued in a lot of predominantly black communities. A lot of things like book smarts or like STEM, that didn't seem very tangible for a lot of black kids or just wasn't seen as desirable, quite frankly. Consequently, ways that we did see ourselves represented are in things like athletics, and entertainment, comedy, acting, entertainers, which those are all good things. However, I think sometimes that can be coupled with that is the way to make it as a black person in the world, is to just pursue these very niche activities. And to quote Dr. Naeem Akbar from his book, Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery, Entertainers and athletes are popular heroes of the African-American community. Physical prowess or comic exploit are the only characteristics black heroes are permitted to express. Intellectual acuity, prophetic vision, moral integrity, technological know-how, and managerial efficiency are characteristics seldom if ever portrayed. Harmful beliefs can also be passed generationally too. 
Things like there is a stigma of mental health in the black community, which I've said this time and time again, this is definitely changing, but that has been a stigma in our community for a long time that prevents a lot of black people from receiving that necessary professional help of healing that generational trauma that we have inherited. Or even the idea of when getting money and getting rich is sometimes considered white man's money <laughs> in some black communities, which again, perpetuates the idea that blackness is synonymous with poverty, which is not true. A lot of black people in America are disproportionately affected by poverty due to ongoing effects of racism, redlining, colonialism, gentrification, all of those things. However, blackness and poverty is not one in the same. So those are some examples of some like maybe not so great things that have come as a result of like black culture and our experience in America. It's complicated. But like I said earlier, there is a ton of amazing things and great things that have come as a result of black culture um, and that have been passed down through the, through the generations. Things like soul food, the way black people make food, it be hitting different. And the many traditions born out of our soul food dinners, like the idea of being invited to the cookout or my personal favorite hashtag that trends every year on Twitter, Thanksgiving with black families. Things like African-American vernacular English, uh, which also is referred to as Ebonics, the way we mold language and a lot of what is basically words created by black culture is just pop culture or internet language now. Another thing, a part of like the values or beliefs adopted by a lot of black Americans is even things like faith. Uh, Christianity and also Islam was adopted by a lot of black Americans. And so that has sort of those uh, religions values have been in ingrained into a lot of black American cultures and a lot of black American families. Not everyone, but I would say a large portion. Another significant way black culture has contributed to the world is through our arts. Poets, playwrights, essayists, and novelists such as James Baldwin, August Wilson, Lorraine Hansberry, Maya Angelou, and Toni Morrison all spoke to the struggle that black Americans face while still delivering a greater message to the world at large. And a countless number of black writers and authors continue that legacy today. Similarly, comedians have been able to do the same. From Dick Gregory to Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, or Dave Chappelle, black wit transcends just the black community. And you can say the same for black performing actors. In a time where American TV shows and movies showed a contemporary American life, quote unquote, black experiences and black stories were oftentimes excluded from that conversation. So black people made our own shows and made our own space in Hollywood in the performing arts. We brought y'all The Fresh Prince, Sister Sister, Moesha, Family Matters, Girlfriends, Martin, The Cosby Show, and so many more. In a time where shows like Friends, Full House, were supposed to depict the average American life. Music has been another conduit for black excellence and black thought. From the soul of gospel and jazz to the liveliness of blues and rock and roll. Yes, black people actually created rock and roll. The social consciousness of hip hop and the sensuality of R&B. At the heart of all these genres are the influences and voices of black people. And hip hop notably being one of the most influential genres of music today, it's important to know that it's a lot more than just a trap beat or words that rhyme. And hip hop culture transcends what you hear on the Billboard Top 100 today. Originally a unique blend of jazz and poetry, hip hop voiced the struggles of black Americans and brought about an entire culture of break dancing, rap battles, street art, MCing, DJing, fashion, and so much more. From DJ Cool Herc to Curtis Blow, the Sugar Hill Gang, and Grandmaster Flash to LL Cool J, Biggie, Tupac, Lauryn Hill, and the Kendrick Lamars, hip hop artists of all different decades have been influential in so many ways. When it comes to fashion and beauty, black innovation truly shines. Rooted in African traditions, black hair has been manipulated in so many intricate ways. From braids and locks to twists and knots, shaves, waves, and fades. Hair in the black community is art itself. And I got me you know my cornrows right now, so 
you already know. <laughs> a lot of low-income black neighborhoods in conjunction with the Vietnamese community have popularized the idea of having long blinged out acrylic nails. What was once seen as ghetto and ratchet is now essentially just pop culture and what you can see a lot of people rocking. And you have to thank the black community as well as the Vietnamese community for that, making nail art more accessible to more people. And we can't forget about the ways black people have influenced fashion through R&B and hip hop. Hip hop fashion is essentially modern day streetwear, from baggy clothes to sneaker culture, chains, Tims, windbreakers, bucket hats, and even the Y2K style, which is coming back now. Black people have also been at the forefront of activism. From Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass to Marsha P. Johnson, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, Malcolm X and MLK, to Angela Rye, Colin Kaepernick, Tarana Burke, and the women who formed Black Lives Matter. There's just so many names. Historically and in present day, black faces have been at the forefront of fighting for civil justice and civil rights for everybody. Our community has been committed to civil liberties, equity, and fighting to be seen as human. And when it comes to black achievement, black excellence is everywhere, even if you may not even know it. We make strides from everything from activism to education to athleticism to fashion and STEM. And I think the whole idea of black boy joy and black girl magic is rooted in celebrating us, the ordinary and the extraordinary. It's acknowledging the struggle while still finding joy despite it. Celebrating blackness and black excellence is having pride in who we are, the many forms we come in, all we've been through, in the magic that still manages to persist. And so that's how I would describe black culture. So just by taking a look at this list, you can see how much of black culture has truly transformed pop culture and has just been influential to the way we live life today. Black culture is pop culture, and especially as it comes to the arts. And so being cool is definitely something important in a lot of different communities or feeling that you fit in. But when you're black, particularly, I think the stakes are even higher for us to feel like we fit into the standards of blackness. And nerdiness directly contradicts that. The hardest part about being a black nerd was that I didn't fit in with anybody. Not to mention before the internet, there were only two black nerds, me and this guy. And in the black community specifically, anything associated with nerdiness is oftentimes simultaneously associated with whiteness, which for obvious historical reasons is also seen to be a threat to blackness. It seems like if you act too black, then you won't fit in with the white kids or the other kids that aren't black. And if you aren't black enough, then the black kids don't see you as black. They don't accept you as who you are. I think when black people imply that you're not black enough, what they're really saying is that you don't seem to exhibit stereotypical black qualities or be well versed in what we generally understand to be black culture. Proximity to whiteness essentially seems to make you less black. And obviously this mentality comes from a place of ignorance because there's not one way to be black, to be black is to be black. Race has nothing to do with your personality or cultural competence. But I really want to look further into this idea of not being black enough, specifically from the perspective of being a geek or a nerd. So I have a couple examples to share with you guys. The first example is a blog post from a blurred who basically just talks about her experience with the term and her experience having her nerdiness essentially equated to whiteness. So it's a bit of a long excerpt, but I think it's pretty good at explaining this. So it reads, I didn't grow up with the term blurred. I just lived it. Outwardly, I blended in nicely while living in Queens, New York. That is until I opened my mouth. I would hardly shut up about my love for Sonic the Hedgehog, role-playing, and watching anime. I hadn't realized that these things were more mainly associated with things white people do, until one day I was told, because I enjoyed rock music and role-playing, that I was not black. I still have to ask myself if I'm black enough to even write about being a blurred. If you're a nerd, it is considered a violation of culture, a betrayal, it's acting white. Growing up black and nerdy was intimidating. I was made to feel ashamed because of the things that brought me joy. So I did what any person would do when getting attacked. I hid. I only let my nerd flag fly high when I knew it was safe, when I suspected that I wouldn't be ridiculed for it. 
When I could find a safe nerd space to converse, it was primarily populated with white men. I had a few female friends, not many of whom were persons of color, who were geeky or nerdy. But black people, no matter the gender, made fun of me for being black and nerdy. And we can see this in several examples throughout media, where black nerd characters are oftentimes the butt of the joke or made to be the less black character or somebody betraying black culture. If you check out this example from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Carlton Banks and Will Smith's character are trying to get into this of uh, black fraternity and they essentially accept Will but reject Carlton because he didn't fit the mold of what they thought a black person should be. I'm not accepting no prep school bel -Air bread sellout into my fraternity. You think I'm a sellout? Why? Because I live in a big house or I dress a certain way? Or maybe it's because I like Barry Manilow? You uh, been Barry White, y'all. <laughs> Being black isn't what I'm trying to be, it's what I am. But when you take a step back and think about it and examine all the things black culture is known for popularizing and all of the things black people are oftentimes recognized for and applauded for, not very often are they things in more nerdy fields. So no wonder there's such an internalized marginalization of black people who possess more nerdy qualities or characteristics. That person doesn't really seem to fit the mold of what we have imagined the black American to be like. And this prejudice isn't just from outside forces, like this is also happening within the black community itself. So why is this? There are a couple speculations. For starters, there's the social pressure of what it means to be black, and that does not mean being nerdy for the most part. People take race and ethnicity with so much pride that if you're excluding people who you don't feel like fit whatever ideal you have for your race or ethnicity, you don't realize how bad it makes them feel. And it doesn't help that. We don't have a lot of like role models or highly visible influences in fields that seem more nerdy. Um, and again, that definitely is changing. Just because black faces aren't at the forefront or may not be the faces of, you know, nerdy fields or endeavors, that does not mean that we are not out here making strides because we definitely are. But it, our black faces shown in these endeavors are definitely not as commonplace as they should be. And we might not have as much exposure to it as a kid, quite frankly, as much as we do like rappers and entertainers and athletes and all those types of things. Also, blackness and competence in black culture is also seen as a status symbol. That's why you see how all these white kids from the suburbs and all these white kids on TikTok trying to be like us, act like us, because it's a status symbol. It makes you cool. It makes you trend. Trying to be black makes you trend. <laughs> I think insecurity is another reason some people within the black community perpetuate this like not black enough idea. In this world, you can get made fun of for possessing stereotypical traits of your identity group, and you can get made fun of for not possessing those traits. So taking this into the context of race, you can be made fun of for being too black, and you can also get made fun of for not being black enough. So not that it's right, because honestly, this is just, you know, sharing more feelings of unworthiness, but putting someone else in a box could be a way that some black people can like process the feelings of not enoughness, if that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that very well, but I'm gonna share another clip from Madison Brown's video. Y'all should just go watch it because it's really good. So she explains this pretty well. I think deep down it comes from a place of insecurity maybe because they know that who they are is seen as sometimes ghetto or uneducated simply because they're just being themselves. And because to them, I have some sort of adjacency to whiteness that it it fucks with their head because maybe they think that because of the way that I am, then I will be more accepted by the white man. And being seen as more palatable to white society has obvious social and professional benefits. And then finally, it can also be financial disparities. As I said earlier, poverty has disproportionately affected a lot of black communities in America specifically, but also in other countries. Science and engineering and like STEM, more technical fields are expensive. And if you don't have the financial resources to send your kids to specific schools or to buy certain equipment so that they can pursue the this, it may seem like out of reach for some black kids. Again, that's not to say it's not possible, but that definitely could be a factor. 
So all of these perceivably nerdy or white characteristics, all of these things is not how we have internally been conditioned to uh, recognize the role that black people play in the world. And so due to this internalized contradiction between blackness and nerdiness, the term blurred was born. So why blurred? I think blurred.com explained this pretty eloquently. Uh, one of the writers writes, representation matters. Quite simply, blurreds were not traditionally shown in the media and have had little representation in pop culture. Not only that, but when we combine the intersection of African-American and nerd culture, sometimes we see or describe things a bit differently. Blurred tend to add their own bit of flavor into the mix when talking about all things nerdy. Calling yourself a blur doesn't mean you want to separate from anything. It only means that you are telling the world that you want to still identify with the part of you that makes you black. And this is why we have things like Blurred Con and other communities for like nerd subcultures, such as the Black Girl Gamers, Black Girl Nerds, Sugar Gamer, I Need Diverse Gaming. I will say the blurred identity is also pretty similar to the quirky, awkward black girl or the quirky, awkward black boy trope, if you're familiar with that. Or even the idea of being called an Oreo, being black on the outside, but white on the inside. In the fact that all of these different archetypes basically exist to categorize black people who may not feel like they fit into the mold or the stereotype of blackness. And if you are interested in learning more about these tropes, these videos up here are very good and worth the watch. And of course, like all my other sources, they'll be linked in the description below. If you don't normally look at my sources, I would really recommend watching them or taking a look at them for this video because there's a lot of really interesting movies and shows and videos that I watch. So. Be sure to check that out. So as time progresses and as society progresses, more black people are starting to embrace this idea that blackness is not a monolithic experience with terms like blurred or the quirky, awkward black girl or black boy. However, not all black people are fond of this term because it seems like another way to sort of categorize black people further and put ourselves into more categories or groups, which is definitely an understandable perspective. But the difference is terms like blurred or the quirky, awkward black girl or black boy was directly created by black people to embrace the fact that the black experience is diverse and multifaceted. It allows black people to be whatever the hell they want to be. In the words of Donald Glover, Because whiteness is blankness. Is because they look at it as a blank slate. Like when you come in, you can be anything. Like when I walk in, even if I have a bow tie, they might be like, "He's is he Muslim? They're not gonna do that with a white dude. Like mm -hmm. white people are a blank slate. And because whiteness is seen as a blank slate and white people are generally understood to be more nuanced and can be more complex coming into the world, that leaves more concrete boxes of what everybody else can be. And although our understanding of blackness is definitely changing, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done both internally and in the media to expand our perspective and horizons of what black people are and what black people can be. And until we can exist in a society that sees black indigenous people of color as complex, nuanced, and you know, comp layered beings, until we exist in a world where black culture is being more accepting of a diverse black experience and black people with different interests and different paths. And until this ideal time comes, terms like blurred and other archetypes will exist to include people who may not feel like they fit into the social norms of their culture. And so that's how blurred came to be. That's the video. <laughs> um, I'm off script now, but I essentially just wanted to make this video because um, I've always struggled with identity growing up. I think everybody struggles with that, but uh, growing up specifically as a black girl in a predominantly white upper middle class suburb, I've definitely been told my interests are white before. Even though I seem very like racial justice warrior now, when I talk a lot about blackness, I seem very proud of my blackness. It's definitely been a journey to get here. And so I really just felt led to talk about identity and the black experience and my experience growing up black in different communities. The world's gonna tell you that you're not black enough for various reasons. And so I hope this can be an affirmation to any black folk out there um, that you are enough. 
You are born enough, you are black enough, and you are enough simply because you are. So yeah, you don't gotta prove nothing to nobody. Keep doing you. And honestly, showing up authentically is a revolutionary act. So my concluding thoughts, I actually have an audio recording that I think kind of sums it up pretty well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and play that. So I hope this video kind of helped you to better understand the nerd caricature, the nerd archetype, uh, black culture and its vastness. Um, and kind of where these two identities conflict. I never felt like I truly fit the nerd stereotype perfectly, but like I've definitely felt not black enough because of things that I was interested in. And so that made me kind of not want to talk about my experiences or my interests in things that seem to be nerdy, even though I don't necessarily, didn't necessarily consider myself a nerd or also because the things that I didn't have knowledge in, the different black things that I'm supposed to know about. Let's also black people hold each other accountable when we see people um, projecting these harmful beliefs that the black experience is monolithic because yo the world already does this to us like we need to really stop doing this to ourselves um, and the world would honestly we would be able to achieve more when we uplift each other and aren't belittling the worth of our own community and so again our enemy is white supremacy <laughs> it's not each other and so uh yeah, I just want to create a space where people can feel heard and seen and, um, enough. So comment below about your experience with nerdiness or blurtiness. I would love to engage in a civil conversation. What did you learn today? What do you want to take away? What have you learned about yourself? I would love to know. Leave a comment below. You hear them bars though. Okay. Honestly, my next project, just forget these video essays. I'm gonna drop a rap album. Um, mixtape. <laughs> coming this summer. Yeah, that's all you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye y'all.